everyone, it's August 27th, 2019. It's Tuesday. It's Harp Tuesday. Welcome to this week's episode. So today I'm going to take a little bit of a look at this lovely minuet in G minor from Mildred Dilling's 30 Little Classics. This minuet by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Of course, I think of Rousseau as being a thinker and a philosopher, but he was also an accomplished musician. And this lovely little minuet is, is quite delightful. And I think you can find the 30 little classics on the Harp archives, actually. But uh, this minuet, this Rousseau minuet, is actually the minuet that inspired Dubois and Conant's Baroque Flamenco. The... Though she encountered it in um, uh, Samuel Milligan's Medieval to Modern, Volume 1, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. But anyway, it's a, it's a lovely little tune, this little minuet, and I thought I would take a look at it. Let me just get my levers set up again. So, the Third Little Classics was written for pedal harp. This is written assuming you're playing on the pedal harp. But if we're playing on the lever harp, it's actually easier because we don't have to worry about this F sharp and F natural that keep coming back again. Um, so actually, if we're playing on the lever harp, we just set the F above middle C up, and that's all we do, no lever changes. And it's quite a, a simple little piece that really, in a sense, there are only eight bars to it. So there's this little phrase. basically repeats and then we literally repeat so there you know four bars almost repeat and then these next right bars are the same and then we get this middle section this little start. So let's just talk about a few of the things that we have going on here. So uh, we have this lovely little set of thirds. It's a great practice because we get to play a third and then we close and open up back to that same shape, getting used to finding in the air the shape of a third or skipping one string in between the fingers. So especially if you're playing this slowly, all these thirds are a great spot to think about some wrist movement, hinging at the wrist, getting away from the strings a little bit, and then falling back down again, which is very important. You don't want to go like this and not fall back down and eventually end up like this. You want to make sure each time you fall back down. Of course, as it goes maybe a little bit faster, it's not super fast, but it has a certain flow to it. A minuet is a very sort of elegant dance. And there's going to be less maybe movement on those faster. But it's nice to think of the bounce. And I think that kind of helps us in terms of getting the sound that we want here and the feel that we want of a flowing Beautiful, beautiful little, little piece. Um, this is kind of interesting here because we're connecting. I think we're probably going to place one and two here. But we're connecting across the phrase because the phrase ends here. And so it kind of would be nice to just... That's how we're... It's almost like a stop. This is the end of the sentence because now we're starting again. But I think we will go ahead probably and connect just because it's worth the, the ease of having both of these notes ready to go versus the sort of reinforcing the phrase. And that can be an interesting question sometimes of sometimes, especially if it's slow, we're really going to try to match the phrase with our fingerings. So if the phrase is ended, we're not gonna, we're gonna come off. Other times, 
it's maybe important to try and be as efficient as possible. And of course, it's more efficient to place both these notes rather than to go off and find that one. This is much more efficient. So it's sometimes a balance. And I would suggest connecting there. So let's see. And kind of thinking about how we want to shape this phrase. We have this four bar phrase, right? From here to here is one big long sentence, as it were. And in a way, this eight bar phrase is actually an even larger sentence. So this is the end of this phrase, but in a way there's a bigger phrase that goes all the way to here. And then this lovely left hand note comes in and thinking about the balance between the two hands. It's not part of this upper voicing, upper tune, but it's a very important note because it's the missing downbeat that the right hand is not going to play this time. And I think this whole little is worth kind of bringing out and being aware of is this lovely little thing happening in the left hand as well as this very obvious tune in the right hand. So I think we have this, we get it again and oftentimes in terms of dynamics is the notes go higher and higher on the staff, they get louder and as they go down they get softer. In this case I think we are actually doing a bit of a crescendo as we go down, a bit of in, building an intensity. So less a big huge rise in volume but more just trying to a little push in volume and a little push in intensity. So we have this beginning. So maybe not even that much but and this thinking about how this building and then coming back down again. Again just subtle stuff we're not doing big huge rises and falls but just trying to give it a certain extra direction so that it's not just it's so that it's not too robotic as it were that second time so I would totally ignore this this forte I, I don't think that's appropriate at all and the second time I think this little descending line we are getting softer right so we come up here a little hint of a retard now she has a comma here and it's always a little bit confusing sometimes whether a comma is a fingering indication or a phrasing indication because is a sort of universal symbol across all instruments. A comma is a breath mark and a, a end of a phrase if you're playing a wind instrument or if you're playing a bowed, an, an instrument that can sustain a sound, you would not hold that note into the next one. You would come off. Um, and generally it means that the phrase, that's the end of a phrase. So on the harp, the comma sometimes is a fingering indication to say that we will come off literally in terms of not continuing to connect. For me, when I publish music, I try to be very specific. So oftentimes I will use the comma as a fingering indication, but I'll mention at the beginning of the piece that I'm only using it as a fingering indication. It's never a phrasing indication. In this case, it is a fingering indication, but maybe it's also a phrasing indication. And of course, this is Mildred Dilling's take on this minuet in G minor, uh, this minuet, whether Rousseau so whenever we whenever we're looking at music right whenever we're reading music we're trying to de decipher these notes and we can try and f figure out what the composer might have intended at that point in time when this music was printed they may have changed their mind later on in this case it's kind of we're trying to figure out maybe what Mildred Dilling wanted and was that actually what Rousseau wanted right so sort of a couple stages of removal and I think we always 
want to build for ourselves a sense of what sounds appropriate to us so that in the end we have to trust ourselves in terms of okay I, i'm not sure this is what's intended or i think this is what's intended but i don't agree with it or whatever just that that the ultimate arbiter is our ear and what sounds good to us um in this case there's a, a clue later on over here that e either Mildred Dilling or Rousseau uh, might have intended that this is a bit of an end of a phrase and that these are pickups into this next bar. So that instead of... If we wanted to do that, we could of course go four, three, two, one, right? We could place... Um, So again, that would also lead one to think, well, maybe the intention is for this to finish mini fermata and that like, little pause, and then we go on. So that, and again, have these become, instead of the tail end of this phrase, and then breath here, we start something new that it finishes here. Who knows, right? It's something interesting to play around with. Again, if we're not trying to make this be a tiny bit of a pause, I think four, three, two, one would be a more appropriate fingering there, potentially. Um, and then this marking is close to the soundboard. Between the staves means it's for both hands. So we're going to play this repeat of these eight bars. We're going to play it close to the soundboard. this forte so it just gives us a different sound and you can experiment with how close you want to get if we get really close again we don't want to get so close that we're dropping the thumb out of its normal position we want that thumb to still be up um, and you also if you get really close there's the danger of hitting the soundboard as you try and close um, even a small amount down can get a different sound but experimenting with, with what you like but it is kind of a neat idea right because we've heard these eight bars now we're going to hear them exactly the same again in terms of notes so it's just giving it a slightly different flavor as if we were orchestrating it and maybe having slightly different instruments play the tune um, and I, I think it's kind of nice and then as I say here's a clue she's put a fermata here and a fermata right is a, it's a stop it's a a pause we get to take extra time as much as we feel it was appropriate which again lends the idea that again either Dilling or Rousseau saw these notes as being pickups and again I think the the uh, medieval to modern um, version doesn't have any fermata so I'm more inclined to think this is a Mildred Dilling thing but whatever I think it's kind of nice let's we'll try it for now um so we've gone A little hard just we need a little bit more context to think about how much time we're going to take there and I'll, I'll do that again in a moment and then we have so here there's kind of a sense of growing crescendo throughout this whole four bar phrase and again if this is very very restrained and elegant and dignified this has a little bit more passion to me this this little that nice descending bass line so notice we go from a fifth G and D to a sixth so just being aware of that in the left hand that okay we're not going to find that same shape we're actually going to keep the thumb on the D it's going to open up back to that D but we are reaching down further but then it's another sixth so now we have to move both the thumb and the third finger down one string and then octave so a fifth two sixths we can kind of get into that shape but then it's onto an octave so this little a little louder a little louder maybe a hint of pulling back towards the end of that and because here again we're going to get 
even more excitement there, right, with these repeated. And again, really being aware of the two different shapes we're going to feel in the left hand. Here's this root position to start with, but then we're going to go down, we're going to find that sixth that we found before, plus this, the third up, so it's a first inversion three note chord, D minor. Same shape on this C minor, and a 158D. A little bit of a break, I kind of like a little bit of a rolled chord there, so we get this. got a writ, I'm taking some extra time, right? Here's a case where I, this is definitely part of this phrase. It's not a pickup, right? It's the resolution. We have this D suspended, um, D major in this case, right? Resolving, but boom. So it's if we could, we'd even crescendo a little bit through that, right? If we could, if we could change the, if we were singing or playing a sustained note instrument, and then back down, and then back to. Again, it's quite short. You might do a full repeat of the whole thing potentially. You can move it up an octave, uh, play around with it depending on what your goal is with a piece. But it's such a lovely, lovely tune and some interesting things to think about in terms of phrasing, um, some nice little patterns, and just uh, a really lovely piece. So I think to close it out, I'm going to try to play through the whole thing and I will um, see you in two weeks' time. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>